All right. Our next speaker is Chris Butler. He's the chief product architect at IPSoft. Chris has over 19 years of product and business development experience at companies like Microsoft, Kayak, and Waze. He first got introduced to AI through graph theory and genetic algorithms during his computer systems engineering degree at Boston University. He has worked on AI-related projects at his startup Complete Seating, which covers data science and constraint programming, Horizon Ventures, which covers advising portfolio companies like Affectiva, and Philosophy, which covers AI design, research, and prototyping, where he created techniques like empathy mapping for the machine and confusion mapping to create cross-team alignment while building AI products. Please join me in welcoming Chris for Conversational Agents for Finance. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you. As, as uh, she was just saying, I'm Chris Butler, and so Chief Product Architect at IPSoft. And IPSoft, if you're not familiar, we started about 20 years ago working on things like IT management services, and through that had to build a lot of different types of automation. And so one of those automations that we've started to build over the last couple years is really that interface to the IT systems that we refer to as kind of conversational agents. And so we're going to cover what are conversational agents. We're gonna talk about this, this concept of the single view of the customer, which is something that's really important to banking and other types of finan financial institutions. We're gonna look at what are some common conversational patterns and maybe some ones that are less common today. And then finally, key factors when building these types of conversational agents. So what are conversational agents? And I'm gonna to try to do this in about five minutes or less, um, but I usually start with what they're not. And so what they're not is even though they involve things like NLP or NLU, it's not magic fairy dust that you can sprinkle on something like AI um, and then suddenly make everything better. It's also not just chatbots, right? We went through this hype cycle about two to three years ago where everybody was incredibly disappointed with the way that chatbots worked. Um, and you would see experiences like this. You know, hi, I'm a generic bot. I want to pay someone money and I don't understand. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why this would happen. A lot of the time it was syntactic. A lot of the time it was because there wasn't a true semantic understanding. But that, that's definitely not what it is today when we talk about conversational agents or cognitive AI, any of those types of terms. Uh, the next thing is that a lot of people uh, will just take a web form and then try to jam it into a, a conversational context. That's also not what these are. Um, it's not something that is going to try to kill us at some point. This is Hal, by the way, from 2001. And it's probably not something that we're going to fall in love with anytime soon. OK. So what are they? Um, and I think there's a couple key terms uh, or kind of characteristics of good conversational agents today. And of those, um, they're semantic. They have true understanding of what the language, the person is saying through their language. It's multi-turn in that both the conversational agent and the human can actually be asking each other questions and giving answers. It's context aware. So being able to pull from all the information you have about someone to be able to provide a better context in their, their conversation. Uh, it takes action. So it's not just about FAQs. It's not just about Q&A. It's about actually doing something for this person. Um, there's conversational recall, which is that it can remember between different experiences, uh, different conversations, what has happened previously. And then it should also learn over time. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that it learns on its own. Um, that's something that we'll talk about a little bit later. But, but this idea of how do you constantly adjust against drift or other types of maintenance of these conversational agents is important. So you know, the way that we think about this, especially with something uh, we refer to as Amelia, is our conversational agent platform. And one bank is essentially a B2C retail skill set for Amelia. Um, being able to say something like, I want to pay someone. And you can see in there that this is not only an intent, but two entities. There's further clarification that's needed by, uh, by Amelia, and it asks the question and then compiles the result to be able to take action. And so that's really what you're trying to get to when we talk about conversational agents. So most importantly, though, it's about being human-centered, right? And I, I like to put up this chart. I do a lot of discussions about design thinking for AI, and this is the D-School interpretation of design thinking. But what's really important here when we talk about conversational agents, it's, it's really about the fact that we're trying to bring an interface from something that is machine-centered how do you actually do something in the IT world is very machine-centered, to being more. And that's everything I'm going to be talking about today. So when we talk about the single view of the customer, if you're not familiar with that term, it really is about how do we start to join all these different data views uh, within your organizations into one thing. And I, I think you know, lakes, oceans, bayous, swamps, whatever type of data collection you're thinking of, um, that's what we mean, is that there's a lot of siloing. There's a lot of different places that data is being kept. And the single view is about how do we in some way combine all these things. 
Um, and of course, there's a lot of benefits to this. I mean, more than anything, it's really about how are you now providing more services to your customers so that you can make more money from them. That's basically it. Um, but the problem is, is that there's something called Conway's Law, which if you're not familiar with that, it really is about this idea that when you are building a product, your organizational structure is very apparent in that product. Um, and the way that I would put it is that you're shipping your org chart whenever you ship a product. And uh, David Bland, who's someone I really love a lot uh, from the standpoint of like design thinking and, and other product stuff, that he says it in a less polite way, is that whatever the dysfunction is that you have within your organization, that is actually what is in your product. And so from that perspective, when we look at, this was a uh, chatbot report in 2018 um, that was done by SurveyMonkey, Salesforce, and a few other people. But the top problems that people had with online experiences were really about and related to the fact that you ship your org chart. And so that meant how your navigation is set up within your experiences, um, not being able to get answers to simple questions, um, basic details about businesses are hard to find. But all these things basically where, because you have lots of different organizations within your organization that are trying to vie for top uh, kind of use within, with, with your customers or your clients or your employees, um, it's very, very hard for people to figure out um, where they should go for particular things. Um, and so, you know, I kind of think about it more from the standpoint that rather than the single view of a customer, it's about how are you creating a single conversation with your customer, client, or employee. Um, and I think that's really, really important. Um, so when we talk about this, this rather than just say handling a transfer, knowing that um, in some way there's a reason why I'm doing this transfer and that being able to now ask if I want to set up a reoccurring payment is something that could just be part of uh, the regular experience but is made better by the fact that you understand or you're making capable something that maybe I do a payment over here with something like peer-to-peer -peer, but then being able to set up an ACH payment because it's related in some way, that's because you understand the, the customer in, in, uh, in, in total. So what are the key aspects when building great conversational agents? And I, I've broken this down into a couple things. So first, uh, just as a very basic set of patterns, um, the first one is really this idea that um, the conversational agent sits between the, the customer and customer support and subject matter experts in the way that we usually would have thought about this, right? It's, it's taking utterances, and this could also be via, via voice, right? So I'm going to be showing examples that look like web chat type of things, but you could think about it from the standpoint of voice within an updated IVR system. It could be um, via devices in your home. It could be a bunch of different things. Um, but I think it's also important to say that it's not just about B2C, right? When we talk about a lot of the use for f within the financial world is that the, the, the Conway's law of your IT organization is also very confusing to people, right? Like they don't always know who they should talk to or how to even talk to those people about those particular things that they need. So password reset is something that a lot of B2C companies have done pretty well. You click a link, you get an email, you click another link. Inside organizations, you may need to update somewhere in the range of 20 different systems. And that's not just your AD. That's like all of these one-off kind of isolated um, systems that also need to be changed in some way. And so really what's important here is that the conversational agent is taking over the aspect of having to understand all of that. The next thing is really this idea of a whisper agent. And so whisper agents are where um, a customer support person or your IT person is still directly communicating in some way with a customer or client or employee, but they're using the conversational agent as a way to make the organization more legible to them as well. So an example that we've used, we, we've been building a, um, a conversational agent for a group that does auto insurance. And during their time, they usually get the question, how do I, um, or why did my bill go up last month? And to do this, they would have to look at a member database, they'd have to look at a policy database and then visually compare the current policy and the past policy. They'd then have to go to a billing uh, system to then look at what is the current status of billing. And then using all of that, they would have to, in some way, give the answer back to the customer. And when we did some random sampling of this, one out of three times, they were wrong. Um, and so being able to even just, as a Band-Aid, whisper agents are kind of this gateway drug into um, conversational agents in a big way. And so that's something I think is a really interesting conversational pattern. The next one is the idea of group chat. And so I think we're going to see more and more conversational agents used inside of a group context. And so that means that actually customers, conversational agents, subject matter experts, everybody are going to be involved in the same chat. And so at the company I was at, Philosophy, uh, before IPsoft, uh, we did a project for PwC and Google. 
and it was focused on field service operations. And so field service operations is basically where if you need to repair something that you can't return back to the manufacturer, so like say the AC system in this, in this building, you can't rip it out and then send it back. You have to have someone come on site and try to fix it. But there's a lot of people that are involved. It's not just field techs, it's also dispatchers, the warehouse, parts runners, et cetera. And so in this particular interface, what we were really testing when we were building, uh, we, we did this through a bunch of design sprints, I'd say probably about a year and a quarter worth of work. On the left-hand side, it's really the status of the job, the basics about the job. But on the right-hand side, you have a conversation where when it starts, it's just between the conversational agent and the dispatcher. But then as more information is made apparent, like what is the real problem, what is the possible solution, it, uh, the conversational agent will then start to include information, but also start to invite other people. So the appropriate field tech or a senior field tech to be able to provide answers about something. So this group, I, I think this is really going to be interesting. It's not something that a lot of people do today, but I think in the future you're going to see these types of agents uh, being involved in group conversations. The next thing is really about escalation. And so uh, we, we talk about this a lot because there are certain things that, that machines should not be doing. Um, so, of course, the usual case here is that the machine doesn't understand or it's not able to take the action in some way. But the more important case is that there are still times when it's appropriate for a human being to be involved. And, and that when we talk about things like compliance or regulatory issues, that's usually the case. You need to have a human being check the box once they review the information. So escalation is a really key aspect of these types of agents. And then finally, there's this idea of learning, right? So as escalations happen, as conversations take place, whether they're escalated or not, there's a subject matter expert that really should come in and look at how the, uh, the, the actual conversation agent is, is operating, what types of escalations are taking place, what type of abandonment of a conversation is taking place, and then looking at it to try to decide, do I need to retrain models with additional utterances? Do I need to add negative utterances because it's misidentifying the intent? Do I need to add an edge case to the process that we're looking at? Or do I need to just have a brand new intent that is something that could make things a lot easier for the people that I'm helping? And then finally, is there more context I can include in the conversation that would do a better job of servicing this customer or client? So those are the kind of main patterns. Um, the thing that I think is really important when we talk about conversational agents is that they're all about interpretive in human language, important aspect of it. So when we talk about making your org chart legible to people, that's, that's what we're talking about when it comes to an, in interpretability. And so I do want to uh, outline one specific point around interpretability versus explainability. I know that there was a keynote earlier today talking about explainability um, and that maybe explainability isn't the thing that's necessary. And I, I would tend to agree with that, right? Like from my perspective, interpretability is way more important. And so this is the only machine learning joke I'm going to include in my talk. But basically, um, you know, the mom asked, why did you kick your sister? Because my attention was on her. Be more specific because of the vector. See embedding 122, 01, 13, 23. So, this kid is being very explainable about why they did something, but it's not actually helpful to the mom to correct the action, right? So from my perspective, it's about interpretability over explainability. How am I using this information to alter my decision-making processes? And so systems that need interpretation, right, like your organizational systems, your IT systems, they need conversations because people may not even know actually how to ask for something. And so from that perspective, you know, if I were to then say something about getting locked out of my account, answering how to unlock my account and being very explainable of the process is not helpful in this case. What you actually want is you want to be able to provide an explanation that is helpful to me so that I can maybe modify my behavior and then I can have an action that takes place that then solves the problem that I have. The next thing is context. And when we talk about context, what's really important here is how do you gain it from the information that you have within your organization? Um, and that could be both about your customers, clients, or employees, but also about what your best practices are. And so there's a couple components there. So one, I think one of the, one of the aspects that is utilized today is usually profile information. Right? Like if we're going to stack rank these as far as helpfulness, I would say that profile info is one of the most, most helpful things when you're segmenting customers, when you're trying to help people. But an often overlooked one is actually behavioral data. So I, I, at Philosophy, I was doing some work with a large financial institution that had financial advisors and customer support representatives. And one of the, I'd say 50% of the time that someone would churn out of that particular financial institution was because they had had a problem on the website or app and was not able to get it resolved. And so because of that fact, if you would just add the idea that there were some type of like, you know, uh, Full Story is a really interesting example of this. They, they do tracking of how people interact with websites or applications, and they have the concept of a rage click, right, where you just jam away or tap on something because you can't seem to get it done. So it's those types of things that are really, really interesting from a behavioral standpoint that can help you provide more context. 
The next thing is about prediction. Um, being able to take all of these signals and then predict better what the intent could be would be very valuable, right? If you see uh, five log, you know, login attempts that have failed, you can probably predict why that person is going to be there. And based on that plus the language they use, you can do a much better job of disambiguating that. The next thing is previous conversations. It's not always helpful, but it can be helpful because you're continuing that. The next thing is just ask, right? One of the things that we do uh, is we have something that's referred to as clarifying questions, where if someone just says, I want to pay to the system, there's a lot of ambiguity there. So we set it up so that you then ask, so the agent will then ask additional questions. Are you talking about a bank transfer or are you trying to pay an individual? And um, then finally, sentiment, right? This is one of those things that people talk about a lot, but I don't think really ever use in any meaningful way. Um, basically, the idea that someone is either upset or happy at your uh, conversational agent, I think is, I mean, you can detect it, but I'm not sure what you do with that information other than escalate if they're really pissed off. They still want to get something done. And actually doing the job of getting it done as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible, will help you avoid whatever the panacea that's being talked about as far as sentiment analysis. So I mean, that's, again, my opinion. But I, I think it's, it's one of those things that can be helpful. But often, more often than not, I have not found a real reason to utilize it within the conversations. So you can see here that <clears throat> providing this context actually feels like a much better experience, right? I'm not actually having to provide that much information in this context. Things are just going to happen. And so when we talk about conversational agents as a center point for context, it's really how are you allowing this person um, to provide any information that, that, or ask for anything that they want, and then being able to react to it. Um, the next thing is abstractions, right? So when we talk about abstractions, uh, these are things that came from computer science. It's the idea that um, you're not going to require people to know as much about the depth of something um, and focus more on what is the abstraction that helps them make a decision. And so a really great example of that is uh, because we're all in New York. Uh, this is one of my favorite articles about MTA policy um, by the New York Times. And so what it talked about was that over the last couple of years, trains have been more delayed over time. And the reason why was because of two key policy decisions. But the problem was is they didn't have the right level of abstraction to actually understand that when they were making these decisions. So my question to you would be, what is the right level of abstraction for us to understand what, I, what, what they should be doing as far as policy making? And so one example is you could use this as the level of abstraction, right? Like, how do the drivers actually perceive um, the way that they do their job? The next thing could be this switch, right, which is the way the switches actually work. They're mostly analog still. Um, but how do these people interpret the way these policy decisions would have either hurt or helped them? And then finally, at this level, right, the entire system itself. And what the New York Times did, which I think is an amazing piece of kind of uh, data science uh, visualization, is this idea that you can, if you have two different aspects of a visualization, you can make a much better policy decision. So on the right-hand side, you have based on the policies, which is basically more spacing between cars versus more delays at signals when cars pass through them. Um, you can actually see how that impacts. In the upper right-hand corner, you see the number of trains that are completing trips um, every hour. You see the actual way that these things get stalled and why they get stalled. And then on the left-hand side, you see the complete space of value decisions that you can make. And that it's not totally linear, it's not even, right? So what they should have done is they should have thought more about the abstraction and how do you actually understand the, the way these systems interact with each other with a particular train line. And so that's what abstractions mean, right? We talk about abstractions in the world of conversations. There's actually two sides to this, right? There's the side that you're trying to understand what someone is asking for with a conversation. And that seems incredibly non-deterministic, right? It seems like it's almost random. Now, the problem is, the, the truth is, is that it's not random at all. It's highly contextual to the, 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 the state that, that person is in, why they are calling, how did they get there? Um, but on the back end side, when we talk about how we need to execute these different processes, is that we need it to be way more deterministic. And so, when we talk about the benefits here, right, the benefits of these types of conversational agents is really that there are a lot of non-experts that need to interact with your system, and you need to make that legible in some way. So being able to understand the context that they have gives you the ability to do all these different things. And when we talk about balancing complexity and usability, right, um, to me, th this is kind of a checklist of things that I, I go after a lot of the time. So first of all, you know, we want to allow for topic switching. This is something that original chatbots could not really, could not do very well. They would try to railroad you down one particular uh, way of, of, of kind of discussion. You want to use the language that people use. So when we talk about this, it, it means that you're not allowing your, your subject matter experts internal to your organization setting the utterances that will be used to train the models. You need to actually use what real people will use with that language. 
Um, the analogies are, are really interesting and hard abstract, right, that, that we need to think about. So a lot of people, when they think about their, say, B2C retail banking, they think about their um, actual account balance as the abstraction. But there are probably better abstractions when it comes to the way that they use their money the tempo of how they pay bills, how does the, the actual value of their account go up and down over time as a time progression rather than a single number. Um, next, providing enough information to make a decision but allowing for agency. So we talk, again, the abstractions that are really important here are how do you allow me to walk away from an experience if it's not the right type of experience for me? And that includes escalation. So the key aspect of this is do people have enough experience with whatever they're trying to do to build a habit? Right? When we talk about banking applications, I have the habit of being able to go into the app, look at my bank account balances, and do bill pay. But how often do I do a reoccurring ACH transfer? How often um, do I have to try to manage a, a money marketing account? Those are things that maybe you don't do all the time. And that's exactly where conversational agents are valuable. It's these, these kind of somewhat infrequent experiences that I need to do that I usually need to keep relearning because the apps and the services are evolving over time. Um, but the truth is, is it's actually a huge amount of volume. You know, if we, if we look at something like the long tail of experiences that people have to deal with with their banks or other type of financial institutions. Um, kind of one other component that is really important is trust. And so when I talk about trust, um, I'm using it in the sense of kind of how people engage with technology. And so this is a paper from 1997 by Para Suraman and a few other people. Um, but Para Suraman is kind of the, uh, kind of the rock star in trust and automation circles, if, if you could say that. Um, and they wrote a paper that I think is pretty, pretty important to think about. And it's this idea of that there's four modes to any type of automation and the way that human beings interact with that. And so that includes use, which is that I turn this thing on and I turn it off and I use it as appropriate. There's misuse, which is that I, I trust it too much to do things that it shouldn't be doing. Uh, disuse, which is that I just don't use it at all. Um, and then finally, abuse, which is that um, the people that actually created the system were not human-centered in some way. Um, and so from a trust standpoint, right, um, I can't tell you the right formula for building trust because it's highly dependent on the circumstance that you're trying to, to, uh, to kind of create a service around. What I can tell you, though, is that there are certain things that will lose trust with customers, and there are other things that will gain trust over time. And so I, I, t I tend to think about it that there's, there's some like minimum bar for things that if you do, people will not trust your service. And so some of those things tend to be no state communication. Um, you're not answering then explaining why something happened. You're not completing the requested tasks, or you're making really, really simple mistakes. There's been a lot of really interesting research that if a machine makes a complex mistake, people are way more forgiving because they feel like they could do the same thing. But if you are making simple errors of judgment that a human being thinks is really stupid, <laughs> they're not gonna trust your system. And then above that, you know, I think this idea of how do, you inter how do you use things like natural language, not going overboard with branding or voice, but that idea of like what is natural language? Um, how do you include the context? And then how do you handle high risk tasks correctly? So if you're doing a humongous bank transfer, it shouldn't necessarily feel like it just happens. It should feel like it's actually taking the right amount of, you know, the right amount of like gravitas of the situation. And so uh, the last piece that I like to talk about is really accountability, right? So um, when, I, when I think about accountability, I like to think of this, this GIF right here. And so look at this. Let's pretend that that white car is an autonomous vehicle. So it has not gotten into an accident yet. It's still trying to make its exit. <clears throat> All right, it made the exit. So this car did not get into an accident, right? And so from an accountability standpoint, um, this is very much related to a really great paper um, about moral crumple zones, in that just in general, whenever we talk about automation, whenever we talk about people inter interacting with different types of systems, um, they think of the systems as infallible in some way. They think of them as just working the way that they should. And then the human beings are actually the ones that are considered to be at blame when something goes wrong. So all of those trucks would have been blamed because it was the human being driving them over the autonomous vehicle was trying to do the right thing. Um, this is something that we've seen over and over again when it comes to uh, automation systems. Um, and, and this is related to a story. So you probably can't see it that well, but this, is, this was basically each one of these notes 
um, was a particular observation for a user research sprint that we did. And each one of those, you know, we had probably hundreds of observations through the entire study. These were in particular about related to that, that, uh, that mock-up I showed you earlier, where it was related to uh, this bot having a conversation. And in particular, how did they feel about the AI or machine learning or prediction or conversational sides of this experience? Um, and so each one of these is, is one, of those, uh, those, one of those notes. And then one of the people on the team, uh, Leah, had a brilliant idea to organize and affinitize these based on two factors. So the, horizontal, the, the vertical is really about below, I don't understand what's going on, to at the very top, I really understand what's going on with the system. And then left to right is negative to positive sentiment. And at first, you know, the way we looked at this is that anything below the line was basically needed more change management, it needed to be revised as far as the user experience, we needed to do a better job in kind of the experience itself, the way that people interacted with it. The upper right hand corner was really people understood what was going on and they liked it. And so that was the things that I was okay with being automated, essentially, that's at least what we, the way we looked at it. Um, and then the upper left hand corner we interpreted as, it's basically, you know, things I understand that's going on but I don't like it at all. And we at first interpreted this as job security issues. Why is this automation taking over my job? After doing some work with regards to how we do ethical deployment of these types of systems, I, I've come to a different realization about this graph. And the upper right-hand corner is really about the idea that this is bullshit work, right? The stuff that you make me do on a regular basis that is ridiculous and time-consuming and not worthwhile, that's this work. The stuff in the upper left-hand corner is not so much about job security, but it's about the things I find meaningful in my job. And so when we talk about like what is accountability, I want to make sure it's clear it's not just for the people that are customers or clients, but also for your employees. How do they interact with these systems is really, really important, um, especially during the escalation case. And so my question to everybody is when you're making these types of decisions to deploy systems that are automated in some way, what if they could opt out? Right? What if it cost you for them to opt out and walk away from the system, but you still had to help them? That would probably make you rethink the way that you end up deploying these systems. And then finally, you know, how do we really keep the meaningful parts of human work involved? How do we allow for people to be creative? You know, machines are great at detecting anomalies. They have no idea what to do with them. And so how do we still allow for this? And the reason why, you know, in closing, is that basically, when we're talking about conversational agents, right, you should be making your org chart more legible to people. Um, you should understand their context. You should build your main functionality for habits. So the first page to your, your site should include everything that is habit forming or habit necessary. But for everything else, you should you really use a conversation um, because that makes it much more understandable, interpretable by people. And trust is really key to, to building the right type of relationship so that people are not just yelling into the void they want to talk to an operator. Um, and probably the thing that we should all be remembering is that it's not so much about the fact that we're building systems for human beings to interact with, but actually these systems are just a way to kind of intermediate between human beings, right? And so this is the Wizard of Oz. It's a great way to do prototyping, but it's always human behind the curtain, right? That's always the case. So thank you very much, and I'll take some questions uh, if we have a few minutes. Any questions? Any thoughts? Have people built conversational agents out here? How many people have done that so far? No? Okay, well, I know those guys did. <laughs> no? Any questions? Does anybody, does anybody agree? Does anybody disagree? No? All right. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, so we use the basic state-of-the-art models for kind of uh, semantic, un uh, the, the understanding of, of that type of emotional data. And so we break it out into a couple different factors. We look at it from an utterance to utterance standpoint and also a conversation to conversation standpoint. So you get kind of like, what is their current emotion versus their mood versus kind of their overall propensity for emotion? Um, but again, I, I think that it's not that helpful. Like even, there's been more recent papers, I think there was one about two months ago that was trying to, basically they had microphoned people they recorded their daily experiences and then they had them diary what they were feeling and, and kind of over time. And they found that there was very little correlation between the text of what they were saying and the true emotions they were feeling, at least as self-reported. And so I'd say that the truth is, is that that type of like sentiment analysis on pure text information is not that great. Now, 
Things like audio, like over a phone call, you can do a better job of things like stress, that type of stuff. And then even if you go a step further, you know, one of the companies I worked with, Affectiva, basically did this where it would look at video feeds of people's faces. Not only could it determine things like heart rate based on the video feed, but also kind of what were they potentially uh, feeling at that moment. They were using it more as a marketing analysis tool, like is this advertisement interesting or entertaining? Um, but they're now starting to move into the space where uh, for people that are driving cars, are they awake? Right? Are they drowsy? Are they distracted? Um, and so I think there's a lot of like possible use for this type of stuff. But you know, video is not used as much when we talk about how you talk with a particular conversational agent. Just most people don't do that. There are some companies experimenting with it. But again, like, what do you? I guess my question is, is like, other than trying to solve their problem or be upfront about the fact that you can't solve their problem or won't, right? I mean, there are going to be people that are going to be upset. Like, say you do insurance, if you just reject their claims, they're going to be upset. Right? So the question becomes, how do you change your experience so that either you're setting the correct expectations up front, you're making it so that they can talk to you about whether the claim is covered or not at first, right? Once you get to that point, though, what can you do other than maybe escalate to a human being that can in some way smooth things over by being human? Right? So that's what I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, one out of three was wrong, basically. Yeah, yeah. No, so now they don't have to think about it, right? Like they're on the phone with someone, they look at the system, it gives them a ranked list of probably why. We, we still could do more. We're working with them to actually get their underwriting system exposing like their explanations, right? Because insurance companies actually don't want true explainability. Right? They, they don't want that. What they want is they want you to be able to do a what-if type of situation that if I get rid of this car, my insurance rate will go, go down because it's an old car. Right? So that, that's what we found so far. But it's still beginning. Right? Like we're, we're really just entering into a main uh, like production phase right now. Right. You had a question? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think when... Now, the thing that's interesting is that a lot of the time people will just, even if you, like, in states like California, you're going to have to start to say whether you're talking to a bot or not, right? And that's going to probably go as far as st different state laws. And um, so that's going to start happening. But when we found, even when we explain that, people are like, whoa, 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 enough about you. Let's talk about my problem, <laughs> right? And, and so I think this idea of one of the things that you can do to really make sure that you're doing this right is you can role play out the situation with another human being. And it feels like, you're not giving the right answers or you're like explaining things way too much. I mean, almost every group like Amazon, Google, um, Apple, they all have kind of like conversational agent guidelines. And one of the things that I think is like across the board is say your script outside because the way you write is very different than the way you speak. And so I think speaking in a natural way, in a way that you would conversate with someone else. Um, now, the problem is there is that do you have enough information to be able to do correct disambiguation, pulling out entities and things like that. So it's a balance. But I'd say that's the number one thing is if you just make it feel like if you if you go overboard with like brand and there, there's one company we've been working with where they wanted to have a slightly different language set for millennials, um, even though they're, they're, they're old news now. It's actually about the zillennials and the people entering the workforce right now, if you can believe that. Um, but but like for that, I mean, I don't know. Do people feel like they're being patronized if it's like a bunch of emojis and like, hey, what's up? You know, I'm totally totally hip with all your banking needs or something like that. So <laughs> I think that's the thing is like being natural, being direct, being like, you know, really that type of per like that type of conversational agent that is just trying to get the job done for them is the most important thing. And if you don't do that, you're going to lose a lot of their trust. Yeah. 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 No, I think this is really interesting when we start to talk about explainability of machine learning algorithms in general, like the idea of a loan application being rejected, for example, right? There's a part that is a notification that goes out in some way that could be an email, that could be something, but you can redirect the conversation to a conversational agent, right? And so the truth is, is that clicking a link in somewhere like a text message, an app or something like that and launching a conversation, it's almost the same. You're just adding a little bit more context about what that person wants to talk about. And that is the notification that they just received. So I think that's definitely a model that is very interesting. I guess I always think about it that's just, it's just a regular conversation at that point. It's just that there's different context injected. But it's a great point. I mean, I, I probably should put in a slide there as like, this is one of those other types of patterns. But yeah, 
Does that answer your question or kind of? What, what's the, what's the, for the, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think some of the big ones tend to be cost savings, right? Most people think about customer support as a cost center. So it's like, how do I reduce that? Now, the thing that's interesting is it's not necessarily that they're trying to get rid of people. There's actually huge amounts of, tr of attrition, like 10, 20% a month in some of these organizations, right? So it's more about the idea that you don't have to replace people as fast as you would have otherwise. But I think the other thing is that, you know, for one of our big partners, Telefonica, they, we now handle, I think it's 100% of their mobile phone inbound customer support. And that amounts to somewhere in the range of like four to five million calls a month, right? Um, and so in that particular case, it used to be that you'd have to wait on the phone for 50 minutes to talk to someone, five zero. And now it's five minutes to talk to a human being. But the truth is, is that they're able to get their answers right away. So I think there's, there's definitely customer satisfaction improvements that start to come out of this. It's just the problem is, is like how you judge that. Usually the people that are doing a good job of that have to look at like LTV and they have to understand how LTV is, LTV is affected by customer sat. And so I just say like, it depends on the maturity of the organization. A lot of the times, the, 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 the main thing is customer support cost is what we're really looking at at first. Yeah. All, right. All right. Thank you so Thank much, you, Chris. If you want my slides, give me your card, and I promise I won't spam you too much. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause.